Modern slavery, it may be the greatest oxymoron of all time. Sadly, it's a horrific reality in today's world. It's rampant and everywhere. It's referred to as forced labor or human trafficking. You can find it stretching from the sex trade to the supply chain. And although it's often said you can't put a price on life, you actually can. Globally, the cost of a human slave is just $90. There are nearly 30 million people living in slavery worldwide. Despite all of our advances in science and technology, there are more slaves today than ever in human history. But our next guest says there is hope. He's gone undercover to expose slaves and slaveholders around the world. He's the lead author of the 2013 Global Slavery Index. Kevin Bales is also the co-founder of Free the Slaves. And he's now hard at work with the Walk Free Foundation. Kevin Bales is here now to share his outlook and his surprising optimism. What makes you optimistic? Well, there's a number of things, Mike, that make me optimistic. And let me just say it's great to be here as well. Thanks. Um, the first is that while that 30 million people is a lot of people in slavery, it's actually the tiniest fraction of our global population of 7 billion to ever be enslaved. In other words, the proportion of our global population in slavery is actually the smallest in all of human history. We've actually pushed slavery to the very edges of its own extinction. And that means if we focus and we push hard, we can get rid of it. What's the most common form of modern slavery today? Well, that's a tough one to answer, actually, because there are so many kinds of slavery today. And, you know, the criminals who do enslave people are clever, and they're always ad adapting and, ad and sort of e evolving the way criminals often do. But there's an awful lot of people in forced sexual exploitation. There's an awful lot of people in uh, forced labor in agriculture, in uh, sweatshops, uh, in basic derivative industries like mining and fishing. Uh, it's all over the place, and it kind of varies uh, from country to country as what would be the most likely to be the, the most common type. You said country to country. You've got this uh, global survey that you've come up with, an index. Uh, what do you find in terms of what countries is this most prevalent in and why? Well, the countries with the highest prevalence, and, and by that we don't mean just the raw number. We mean what's the proportion of their population. So you have countries who still practice old forms of slavery. And I think Mauritania on the northwest coast of Africa, that desert nation, uh, is the country that has the highest proportion of its population in slavery, and it's also one of the most old-fashioned. So you see hereditary slavery there uh, being operated under a fundamentally racist context. So you have part of the population which are which are ethnic Berbers. They basically own the country and run it. And then we have uh, Africans, black Africans from further south in Africa who have been enslaved there for generations and are literally owned by, not legally anymore, it's now illegal to own slaves in Mauritania, but the, nobody's bothered to tell the slaves that. The, the, the ownership continues fathers to son to child to and so forth so it goes on and on like that and I think that that would be a, a common misconception I would imagine of most people when they think about modern day slavery they don't think that this is generation upon generation upon generation and yet you do see cases of that don't you you do see it in, in lots of other countries as well. It's not uncommon to find hereditary forms of, of debt bondage in India, Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in other parts of West Africa, some parts of East Africa. But I have to say, that's not the most common kind, the, 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 the type where there's lifelong slavery and hereditary slavery. You know, today we're in a just-in-time, quick-motion economy, and slavery itself has also become shorter in term, faster, uh, it, it, it doesn't, it's not about shipping people vast dis distances at high cost because for the most part, interestingly, people who come into slavery today often pay for the privilege of being enslaved thinking they're actually paying to be smuggled into a country to get a decent job and, and to live in a safe place. We were, uh, in, in the introduction to you, we were talking about the price of freedom and that you can't put a price on a human life, and yet you figured out uh, a number, $90. How did you come up with that? Well, that's an average, of course, across the whole world. And, and, and I, I came up with it by recording every situation where we could find 
and have reported back to us, often by the people who had been enslaved themselves, how much they were passed on or sold to or what it cost to acquire them. And they could, they, we could put that together. What we know is that in the past, slaves were really expensive. If you go back to the Deep South in the United States, the average slave in 1860, average slave, cost about $1,200, $1860. And in, in 1860, you could buy a house for $1,200 or, or three or 400 acres of land. It was the equivalent of about $40,000 to $50,000 in today's money. Slaves throughout history have been priced at that kind of level. But since the 1950s, the population explosion has basically glutted the world's supply with potential slaves. There are probably six or 700 million people in the world who live in places where they're very poor, the rule of law does not protect them. They suffer terrible discrimination. They're easily enslavable by people, by criminals who are willing to use force. Now, because there are so many people in that situation, it's just a rule of supply and demand. You flood a, a, a market with a particular commodity, in this case human beings, and the price is going to fall. So when I say $90 seems to be the average worldwide, you know, it's true that if in North America, in the richest countries of the world, people are paying in the low thousands, maybe up to $10,000 to get a person that they can have total control over. But we also know that in the poorest parts of India, Bangladesh and Pakistan, places like that, the cost of acquiring a person into slavery can be as low as five or $10. The average is around 90. So you just linked two words that most people don't think about, uh, humans as commodities, how does one get to that point where they, they can, you know, look themselves in the mirror and think that it's perfectly okay to have somebody there working for them as, and that they're not, no longer a human, they're a commodity? Well, of course, it's hard to understand if you're any sort of a decent human being. I've had the, the interesting experiences of actually talking to people who hold people in slavery. They didn't know that I was an anti-slavery worker, I was doing it undercover, often uh, pretending to be a journalist who wanted to know more about their types of businesses and their types of agriculture or mining or something like that. And, and you know, the rationalizations, the justifications they use are, are, are ones that have been used for thousands of years in human history. I've been told, these people aren't like us, they're simple, they're like children, they need help, they actually respect discipline. You know, if we didn't take care of them, they wouldn't be able to take care of themselves. Or I've been told, you know, these people aren't of my religion. They're of a religion which means I can treat them any way I want to. Or we're talking about women here, they'll say. You know, women don't matter, children don't matter, and particularly women and children from this tribe, which isn't my tribe. You know, it's racism, it's ethnic discrimination, it's sexism, it's anything that a person can use, whether it would be you know, like the anti-Semitism of the Second World War, whether it was the racism of the American Deep South in the 1960s, anything that you can use to justify mistreating and taking control of another person's life. So, Kevin, somebody may be watching this broadcast and they may say to themselves, how can that be possible? They say the exact same thing you said. Now, naturally, they can't go out there and become Kevin Bales, but what can people do that are watching this broadcast to, to move the needle in the right direction? The truth is there's slavery in every country in the world, and because of that, it's possible that you could bump into it. That and what you mentioned earlier, Mike, which is about the supply chain, to look at some of those things that you've got and say, you know, if it's really likely that there's slavery in my, in my mobile phone, in my cell phone, in my laptop computer, maybe I need to at least drop a note or go on the websites and say, what can you do to assure me computer company that in fact I'm not getting slavery in, in the things that I really like, like my phone. And I, and I think it's worth thinking hard, especially if you're the sort of person who'd be watching this program, to say, what could you do to support an anti-slavery organization? They're often out there operating on a shoestring and literally getting people out of slavery at the risk of their own lives. And it's not hard to find anti-slavery organizations these days. You can just Google it and, and pick one you like. Kevin, can you see an end to slavery in your lifetime? Well, I hope so. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping to live a long time, and I think it would probably take 20 to 30 years to bring it to an end if we begin to get the resources right. Some years ago, I wrote a book about how much it would cost to end slavery, and, and, and I think today it would probably cost about $15 billion to end slavery, which is actually not very much money. 
uh, it would, you know, compared to say the fact that Seattle is about to build a tram system that's going to cost about 15 billion dollars. It's 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 peanuts in the global economy, especially over 20 to 30 years. But we need to have that focus. We need to have governments say we really will enforce our laws. We really will invest in the in the in the ending of slavery, and we're going to put some effort, commitment, and manpower to it, some people power into it. The good news here is that if we do that, it actually pays a big dividend. There's a freedom dividend. We've been calculating this up and building the economic models. And if we get people out of slavery, it actually increases the world economy. It increases the GDP of those countries that have the most slavery. It's going to be better for everybody, not just the slaves, but for everybody. Kevin, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, it's been great to be here, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, we'll meet a human trafficking survivor who is bravely sharing her story with the hope of helping millions of other victims. Oh.